So, ladies and gentlemen, we have almost reached the end of a really long day, but we still have two highlights for the end. We have our discussion on arms control, and we have a spotlight interview with the Der Spiegel with Annalena Baerbock, the co-chair of the Green Party in Germany for the end. We will not have a break afterwards, so you will now have the last 90 minutes, and I promise you that afterwards we will all invite you to a nice, cozy, and relaxing dinner downstairs. So please stay immediately after this panel for our spotlight interview with Der Spiegel. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the greatest achievements of the end of the Cold War was certainly the US-Russian arms control regime, an architecture that now is eroding. The INF Treaty has collapsed, New START is under threat. At the same time, China has entered the arena as a new powerful actor in global peace and stability. Efforts and calls to include China in this arms control structure have so far received a very clear Chinese no. At the same time, tensions are mounting between the US and China, for instance, in the South China Sea. We would like to know your opinion about these mounting tensions and to see whether there is a gap between the expert community in the room and the public perception of the Germans outside. For the Berlin Pulse, we have asked the German public against the backdrop of this development, how likely is the possibility that the current Xeno-US confrontation turns into a Cold War? This is now your opportunity. You all have voting devices on and below your seats once again, and the speakers are also cordially invited to make use of these. And you have four options from very likely to somewhat likely to somewhat unlikely and to very unlikely. 10 seconds go from now. Please vote and just press the button. <laughs> In a few seconds, we will get the results of this audience, and then we can compare how it differs to the German audience. So interesting, this audience thinks that 48% think that it's somewhat likely 35% think it's somewhat unlikely. Germans seem not to be overly concer concerned in comparison. You see here our results from the Berlin Pulse. Here, 56%, if you count together, somewhat unlikely and very unlikely think it is unlikely. 42% think it is very likely or somewhat likely. With this in mind, and with these results in mind, I think it is a great, my great pleasure to welcome a distinguished panel on arms control, including different perspectives. We have on this panel Antje Lehnitz, the State Secretary in the Federal Foreign Office. We have with us Alexander Grushko, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs from Russia, Richard Byrd, Ambassador in the US Chair of Global Zero, and Tung Zhao, who is a Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. This discussion will be moderated by Des Brown, Vice Chairman of the Nuclear Threat in Initiative, and you can, as always, contribute questions with the hashtag <coughs> Berlin Forum. So please, gentlemen, this is State Secretary, the floor is yours. You just sit here, I'll take the middle one, I think. Okay. So, good afternoon. Um, let me introduce this uh, subject sh shortly. Uh, but before I do, I want to share some ground rules that I've imposed on us. <laughs> um, so, we have one hour. It is my intention that we will split that equally between the panel and uh, you, the audience, for questions. Um, secondly, you will have noticed that this panel is badly balanced in terms of gender. I don't, it's no criticism of the organizers. It was much better balanced, but the unavailability of one panelist has caused that, and we're pleased we got a last minute stand in. Um, but because of that, it is my intention that when we get to questions that I will only ask women to ask questions 
until such times as we get some sort of gender parity into this. And I might also say... I might also say that, well, I will have a, a bias towards younger people because this, this um, particular subject is about our future, our shared future. You know, and those of us who are on this panel are in, well, not all of us, but some of us are at least partly responsible for the problems that we are going to discuss, but you will have to live with them. So I think at the very least, we should be prepared to try and tell you how you can do that and how you can control some of the challenges that we're about to discuss. So my final kind of general point is that Tina Hassel this morning, the moderator of the first panel on multilateralism said, when she looked around the room, she thought she was preaching to the converted. I'll be surprised if that's how this plays out. So uh, I think we will be in for some challenging, um, differing contributions here, but this is a challenging issue. Okay, so over most of the past two decades, those of us who live in the Euro-Atlantic space, which I remind you, is a part of the world with over 90% of the world's nuclear weapons, have lived through a period during which we have witnessed the deliberate and accelerating demolition of the arms control architecture that for decades before provided us not, you know, with uh, the disarmament that some expected, expected that it would, but restraint, at least transparency, and predictability both of uh, nuclear forces and conventional forces to a significant degree. So, we can go through all of this story, but that would take up the hour. But the first blow was struck in 2002, when the United States withdrew from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, the ABM, and, and may be completed uh, with the expiry of the 2010 New START Treaty in 2021. So in less than two years, the last remaining agreement to limit and monitor the deployment of US and Russian strategic nuclear forces could unravel completely. And contemporaneous with this, uh, contemporaneous with checks and existing weapons falling away worldwide, uh, new technologies threatened to further destabilize the military balance. Sophisticated cyber attacks, for example, could compromise early warning systems and command and control structures, including for nuclear weapons. Delivery systems that pair conventional or nuclear warheads with hypersonic boost glide vehicles or cruise missiles, which travel at high speeds at low altitude and can elude defenses may be upon us. In fact, to me, well, we may discover later in this discussion that they're already there. Then the militarization of outer space, China, Russia, India, you know, have all built anti-satellite capabilities and Washington is mulling over a dedicated space force. So this technology, let me put it this way, I spend 20% of my time at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk in Cambridge University. Um, I'm rapidly coming to the view that there's hardly a modern technology that is not capable of dual use in some way or another. It's a very terrifying environment to be in. So let me just close these remarks by congratulating Germany and Foreign Minister Maas and his team for rethinking arms control. This is a significant challenge. Um, hopefully some solutions to these challenges will begin to emerge shortly. But Foreign Minister Maas in March 2019, and I'm going to quote him, explained, I think, the world that I now live in in my head much better than I could, and he did it in English. So new technologies, he said, are more susceptible to proliferation, manipulation, and misuse than conventional weapons. The question is whether we're in control of technology or whether ultimately it controls us. So State Secretary, having first congratulated you on this initiative, <laughs> Um, I go back to my own introductory remarks because I want to ask your opinion about the consequences of this erosion of arms control. 
the 1987 Intermediate Range uh, um, Nuclear Treaty, which uh, b b banned an entire class of uh, destabilizing nuclear capable missiles in European territory, is effectively no more. And that clearly generates an ex a threat to us and a potential increasing threat to us in terms of European security, because this is the sandbox in which this problem will be played out if it develops against our worst fears. If New START is allowed to expire, any remaining transparency on both sides of uh, both sides nuclear arsenals, including on-site inspection by each country, will vanish with it. So this comes at a price. So what, in your estimation, will that price be both for Europe and for the world? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Des. And um, um, first, I would like to thank you, of course, uh, for congratulating uh, the German Foreign Minister or the Ministry of Rethinking Arms Control um, because of the new technologies we, we face. Uh, but on the other hand, I wanted to state that we want others to think with us, you know, not only rethinking and rethinking. Um, what I have to uh, say is that, of course, with your question, you're directing me in this, uh, um, in, in, in an answer that is uh, kind of giving up on the New START extension, which I will not fall in this trap. I think uh, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't uh, take this for granted, and there are very, very good reasons for uh, both parties of this treaty to extend it, and of course also European uh, security and uh, the security of the world. Uh, there are many, uh, many good uh, reasons to um, strive for an extension. So this, uh, this very um, question, you know, asking me to speculate what will happen if this is not extended, I will not take this question. I would just refuse to answer this question because I think we have to stick to plan A, why? Because um, the extension of the New START uh, treaty is, is in, in our um, view really essential for giving us the necessary time to heal all uh, the mistakes we made in the last 20 years and will probably um, even make uh, further if we do not come to a stop now. Because what you described is the kind of uh, bad developments that we had on both sides. We were eroding the system uh, that, were, uh, that was coming up and we were inherited, uh, inherited from the Cold War times and the times after the, uh, the fall of the Iron Curtain. So the uh, US, Russian, uh, mainly, um, um, and also uh, European um, uh, arms control treaties. So um, we have to preserve what is left, which is indeed the New START treaty and all the knowledge we have and, and confidence building uh, uh, um, options we have when we meet in, in, in the arms control uh, world. So extension of the New START treaty is not given up because it uh, limits the size of the two biggest, still two biggest strategic arsenals. 90% of the nuclear arsenals uh, are in the hands of the Russians and the US. And this is also an answer to the introduction of, you know, declaring a new era of new challenges uh, like CNO US confrontation. I think there, we have to deal with that uh, issue later, maybe also in your questions, but now I'm answering on Russia-US uh, situation and in our clear interest, and we're telling that both the Russians and the US clear interest, uh, European interest, German interest, is there, is there should be an extension. And I refer to the limits on the size of the two biggest uh, strategic arsenals, but there is also an inspection regi regime that offers still um, insights, in, valuable insights for both sides, and that has to be preserved. And I'm referring uh, to the article you probably read uh, in New York Times by Rose Gottemuller, where she made a very good and pertinent case, also um, in the perspective um, of the United States, why there is a, a plus and a, and a clear, um, um, not only time-winning aspect, but also clear security gain in extending this uh, treaty. Um, so, I'm, um, uh, having said this, um, extension offers us time also to react to some new challenges which you mentioned. Um, uh, technology, uh, technology, uh, te technological um, uh, developments that we lost so much time in the tw 20 years past to try to, uh, to hold up uh, the erosion of the system and we missed 
all this time we would have needed to prepare for the new uh, challenges because of the techno technological advance we have made in weapons, uh, also in warfare uh, um, uh, in, in the last uh, 10 to 5, maybe also in the, sh uh, in the short, in the last two years. So I think we have to do both, preserve the new St uh, START treaty, try to preserve um, the utmost we can get of the traditions we have in confidence building and talking about, um, for example, in the NPT review conference context uh, next year, uh, talking about arms control, but we also have to face the new technologies and maybe um, as a last word, we have to, uh, in this context, and Russians, Chinese, US are participating in these conference we organize on rethinking arms control. Then we have also to make the case for new technologies or uh, to offer answers on that and to have a dialogue on maybe factoring in the Chinese uh, arsenal that is growing or the Chinese uh, uh, perspective and having a more multipolar um, approach than we had in this Russia-US uh, context uh, over um, the last uh, decades. So thank you very much. I mean, I just, I just shared a short anecdote with you from my own experience. Um, while saying that I do, uh, I do greatly support your um, your wish to preserve, to, to protect the the New Start Treaty, see extended for all of the reasons that you have so eloquently given. Um, that, that that was, of course, European countries' position about the INF. I mean, I remember this actually happened to me. I was. I was in the House of Lords where I'm a member listening to a minister from our Foreign and Commonwealth Office defending the INF just at the point when a defence minister at a NATO conference was agreeing with the United States that they were right to derogate from it. So I just, I hope that we in Europe can managed to sustain a position, the position that you have explained through the pressures, whatever they might be, that come upon us. Anyway, Alexander, uh, Minister Grushko, I come to you now because this, uh, this issue is, of course, the extension of the New START Treaty requires the Russians to fight for it as well as just express their willingness to have it. So today we have just learned, and it's been pointed out to me by another panelist, because I didn't notice this myself, that the uh, Russians have offered the inspection of a hypersonic weapon uh, by, to the United States um, in the context of that uh, treaty. So in a sense, that treaty has met with modern technology and survived, at least in terms of your interpretation. So maybe you would like to explain to us what contribution the Russian will make to our joint willingness, I think, to have this uh, particular new start, the, the New START Treaty extended, um, and any other comments you may wish to make on yeah. the consequences of where we are. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to join this discussion, this debate, extremely timely, very important. This is in the nerve of international policy and strategic thinking. But before that, I would like to say a few words about arms control as such. Uh, sometimes I do believe that arms control like a bicycle. You know, it's uh, more or less easy to keep it in motion when it moves. And uh, we know the story that all arms control treaties uh, were not a rosy history of marriage of young men with young lady, but it was about overcoming very uh, difficult issues, implementation, gray zones, loopholes, circumvention, addition of new types and equipment systems, how to deal with that, locations, dislocations, political factors, new factors affecting strategic stability. But when bicycle stopped, it is very difficult, you know, you have to develop extra effort uh, to bring in the motion, to deliver political willingness. Sometimes it's not enough uh, to achieve a uh, concrete result. Point one. Point two, the very existence of negotiations on different equipment and weapon systems is as such a very important stabilizing measure. Because arms control is not only in the final results 
uh, be it limitations, verification, information exchange. Arms control is the, is the only instrument that allows the language of political intentions to translate into very concrete language of military power, dislocations, deployment patterns, all kinds of things. And through these daily discussions, and uh, I, I think that uh, Richard Bird could, could add to that, with daily discussions, you increase, first of all, the trust between parties involved, and secondly, uh, you uh, create a platform which allows you, together with your partners, to uh, address the most difficult issues. When it comes about the start, it's absolutely the same story. We are very interested in maintaining, supporting this regime, because this is presumably could become the only remnant of the arms control, which uh, with the uh, invested political will managed to establish uh, 20, 30 years ago. Secondly, this is also very important because um, extension of the START Treaty will give us extra time uh, to address new factors influencing strategic stability. These are really um, uh, new, new technologies, hypersonic weapons, uh, gliding platforms, American uh, prompt global strike, and I could continue this debate. But it will be easier and more promising to do it in the situation when START Treaty is in place. So while answering your question, I would say yes. First of all, we are very interested because this is about our security. And finally, arms control is about more security with less means. That's it. Uh, and we hope very much that the United States will agree with our proposal to start negotiation about extension of the START Treaty. And secondly, that the U.S. administration will respond to our proposal to engage seriously in discussion on all the factors affecting strategic stability, including ABM systems and all kind of that stuff, which is very important and which should not be uh, kept out of the scope of this strategic debate. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel Alexander. So we're going to, I'm going to move now to new technologies. Um, and we'll come back, I think, to some of those issues that you've raised when I come to Richard but Tung. Um, so the idea that major powers are engaged in technological competition is nothing new. Um, but what is new is this uh, perception that technology, particularly artificial intelligence, is perceived to be central to the future economic um, and, and, and to future economic and military power. I mean, everything is now discussed, it seems to me, through this sort of perspective. And in respect of which, of course, China is believed to have this unique combination of advantages when it comes to developing and applying technology. And we could list them, but I, I think it'd be tedious to do that. So, I, I mean, I'm very grateful that we have you here because of your expertise in this space and also because of your knowledge of, uh, of, of, of China. Um, so my question is that in technology, as I said earlier, seems to me in the modern environment to always have a dual use. So it offers opportunities and offers challenges. And the question is where it can be used for military or other purposes, is it susceptible to arms control measures or the sorts of arms control measures that we have been deploying up until now? Mm. Well, I think I'll make a related point to your question, which is in the, in the survey before this panel, I, I chose the uh, second one, which is the Cold War is somewhat likely. Uh, because uh, one, the, the, right, if you look at US-China, their rivalry is driven by a fundamental problem of ideological uh, confrontation, and as a result, they are particularly attentive to uh, how to win this competition in high technologies. They see the, the victory in that battle as critical to uh, safeguarding their national interests uh, in their uh, strategic competition. Um, so I think the big powers, especially U.S. and China, you know, they see the importance of this technological competition, and, and both of them actually also feel very confident 
about their respective capability to outcompete the other. So all these factors mean that this competition uh, is likely to be very intensive and will be long-term. In terms of arms control, uh, given that our existing understanding about how these new technologies may yield military benefit are very limited. We don't know, but we believe it could be huge. Um, and that understanding, I think, is further driving people to, to compete rather than to control them. So there is very hard, uh, I think it's very hard to, to try to effectively control the development of such technologies. With that said, I think the focus of arms control should be in the more feasible area of avoiding the most ugly competition, especially in areas that they generate particular risks to international and regional stability. Um, you we talked about hypersonic weapons. Um, they can be, they are already used in the case of Chinese DF-30, uh, DF-17 missile to deliver conventional warhead. But in the future, they could also be used for delivering nuclear warhead. Um, and this dual capable system, if they are mobilized in a crisis, they will send very confusing signals to the enemy and could uh, get um, misunderstanding and overreaction. Uh, we talk about um, uh, um, cyber. Um, if we use cyber technology to interfere with an enemy's nuclear command control system, that would create a wide range of opportunities for misunderstanding, panic, and overreaction in a crisis. So I think there are areas where the risks are particularly high, and we should work together to identify those areas and to ban the application of the technologies in such areas. The problem today is the country's understanding of the risks in these areas is very preliminary. You know, we, you know, Carnegie uh, has conducted research in some countries and the result is the decision makers and also their advisors, they, have, they simply have not appreciated the potential risks. So the first task, I think, is to simply raise awareness. And if awareness is reason, then even if cooperative measures are not possible, the countries can take unilateral measures um, uh, to uh, shape their nuclear postures in a way that mitigate such risks. Another thing is the new technologies, they could potentially affect existing weapon systems, uh, especially in the area of nuclear weapon systems. Countries like Russia and China are very worried that new technologies like conventional hypersonic weapons, cyber, counter space weapons, space-based sensors, um, missile defense, they could undermine their most critical security interests, their nuclear deterrent. However, I think, based on my technical research, their understanding of the impact of the new technologies are in many cases exaggerated. They are exaggerated because we have not conducted thorough analysis. We have not talked with each other to find common ground. Um, and it's very easy, therefore, to have worst case scenario thinking about the, the impact of the new technologies. That's another area, I think, international cooperation dialogues can take place starting now to narrow our gap of understandings about the impact of new technology. So to summarize, I think radical arms control measures to regulate new technologies is going to be very hard, but there are areas where we can do things to reduce the risks, uh, reduce the risks while we continue to compete. Okay, so there is, a, there is of course another interpretation of that analysis, which is that the reality may create instability or destroy strategic stability. The absence of knowledge of what the reality is and the fear of that may of itself create 
strategic instability and therefore a tendency to use first these weapons, which is what, of course, we must avoid at all costs. Um, so, Richard, um, you, of course, as the chief negotiator of the original START Treaty, you know, embarked upon that after a period in which we thought that arms control had been lost during the 1980s, but was refound very successfully and very strongly as, a, as an element of our security. So my question to you is, you know, given that significant history that you have, you know, are the principles that we apply to how we um, prevent military conflict between major powers, um, are they different in an environment that is a mixture of old technologies and new technologies, such as the one we're living in and we think about all the time? Yeah. Or are they the same basic principles? And if so, what are they? Well, I think in, in, a, in, a, in the most basic sense, the principles are the same. And the best way to talk about those principles is to say that I'm old enough to remember the age of maybe uh, 14 or 15 years old, coming home from school and having my parents sit me down, turning on the television and seeing John F. Kennedy announce in a nationwide television address that U.S. reconnaissance aircraft had found Soviet missiles deployed in Cuba. And that, those were the famous missiles of October. And for about two weeks, the world held its breath. Because in, in many conversations I've had with Russians since then, as well as with Europeans, we came about this close to thermonuclear war. And the principles, I think, that put us on a course, and John F. Kennedy very shortly after the Cuban Missile Crisis gave a very famous speech at American University in Washington, D.C., and said, we have to do something about the nuclear arms race. That led to then a uh, threshold test ban treaty, the beginning of strategic arms control. Let's call it the golden age of arms control from the 70s and 80s into the 90s. The two principles that I think were overarching there, one was predictability. We, we, we take predictability now for granted, but we used to both sides, both the Russians and the Americans and others engaged in worst case analysis. We thought the other side was going to build up and so we had better build up. That led to the entirely absurd situation, beginning of the Reagan administration, which I entered in the early 80s, where both sides, Russia and the United States, deployed together over 50,000 nuclear warheads. We had in our nuclear war plan, which, I, which was then, of course, very classified, but in that period, we had there was a target in Moscow we were going to hit with five different nuclear weapons. So predictability is critical, and that goes to the point about the extension of, of New START. We do not want to lose the predictability which is, which is built into the New START Treaty, which limits most of the most important limit is the, the limit on number of warheads where Russia in the United States, both are permitted to deploy 1,550 nuclear warheads. Now, second to predictability, the other overarching concept, and Des Brown was referring to this, is stability. And what do we mean by stability? Well, what we, way we've defined it in the nuclear era is basically the idea that nobody wants to have an incentive to use their nuclear weapons in a crisis. In other words, both sides have the ability to retaliate so that they don't feel that they, they will be threatened by a disarming first strike. Now, that's also very critical because anytime there's a big disagreement with a nuclear power, and remember, folks, we're not just talking about the United States and Russia. We're not talking just about China here. We're living in a world now where not North Korea, potentially maybe South Korea, maybe Japan. We've got India and Pakistan. Iran now, it's no longer the JCPO, JCO, 
JCPOA is uh, in very bad shape, and the, Iran the Iranians are now enriching uranium. Turkey is talking about acquiring a nuclear weapon, so we don't have to just worry about vertical proliferation, U.S.-Russia buildup, but horizontal as well. That takes me very briefly to the new technologies, and here is where we face a real conceptual problem, and I agree very much with my Chinese friend. Uh, there are th three or four areas where new technology is breaking the concepts or breaking down the barriers or the, or the, the divisions that allowed us to negotiate arms control in the past. One is between nuclear and conventional. And our Russian panelist mentioned prompt global strike. Well, what that is, is that's an American conventional long-range weapon that is capable to take on a strategic role because it is so accurate. So we can carry out nuclear-type operations on a, on a ballistic missile that in the past could only be done by a nuclear weapon. Secondly, a total blurring of strategic and tactical. Remember, we talk about START as strategic arms reduction treaties, but if you can't distinguish with screw different types of new cruise missiles between strategic and tactical, what's in and what's out when you sit down across a negotiating table? Offense, defense, because of the ABM treaty, both sides only deployed offensive weapons, but now defensive weapons are allowable because, correctly, the United States walked out of that treaty. Huge mistake as far as I'm concerned, but we did. And now there's a new generation of defensive weapons under development, so-called uh, directed energy weapons, boost phase intercept weapons, which could destroy a missile on its launch. And this is going to, again, raise the unpredictability and challenge the stability of the overall balance. And finally, there's the issue, issue of new participants. We can't talk any longer just about the U.S.-Russia balance. I know this causes problems for our Chinese friends. I know they have a strategy of minimal deterrence, so their forces aren't as large as the U.S. and Russian forces. But at some point, China, because of its technological development and because it is modernizing its forces, we've got to be creative and find a way to bring China into this conversation as well. So I, I would just simply conclude that we need, and this is where I think the, the statement here was so wise, we need a good five years at least of real creativity. And as much as some people on this panel won't agree with me, I don't think it's going to happen in the U.S. government. I don't think it's going to happen in the Russian government. And I'm sorry, I don't think it's going to happen in the German government. It's got to happen in research organizations first, in the academic world, where we're creative about coming up with new conceptual approaches to predictability and strategic stability in the years ahead. And I'll just end by saying, and I say this is particularly important to Des, because he's so correct to talk about young people. You know, as, as important as it is to do something about plastic bottles, which is a huge threat, I understand that, we've also got to do something about nuclear weapons. So I hope young people get into that issue as well. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Okay, so we breached my first rule. So, so we have 20 minutes left, I think, for questions, but we're not going to breach the second one. So there's no point in men putting their hands up until three women speak. So this lady here in the, in the red, we'll take three questions. This lady here, come on, there must be another woman in the room who wants to ask a question, please. There's one over there, Des. Okay, wait a minute. This, I think, well, well wait, I, okay, well, I'll take four. So th this lady who put her hand up here, and who else? Yeah, okay, so you know who you are, the four of you, please, this lady first. Okay, so we'll take all four of your questions and then we'll um, try to answer them, if we can. Thank you very much for the possibility to ask a question. Elena Chernenko from the Commerçant newspaper in Moscow. I have a clarifying question to um, Deputy Minister Alexander Grushko. American officials, uh, when being asked about uh, the prolongment of the START Treaty, 
usually say that there is no need to rush, that such a decision can be taken even last minute. So do we have a deadline here? Um, and, or is it uh, really possible on the 4th of February 2021, like five minutes to midnight, that uh, the State Department sends a notice to the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and it's okay? So can we actually wait until that last day or does this decision have to be taken earlier? Thank you. Okay. Second, this lady here. Um, Kim Oberkfell from the IISS. I have a quite a simple question. What or how are you planning on bringing China into strategic nuclear arms control? Got thank it. you. Got the answer. Okay, thank you. There's a lady, lady there who, with the white shirt on who's... Okay. Um, I didn't hear uh, much uh, being spoken about the weaponization of space and the potential uh, arms race uh, taking place in space. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is regarding the Moon Treaty that has been declared a failed treaty, and this basically prevents the Moon from being turned into a real, uh, estate, a real estate property and basically saying that the Moon belongs to all humanity. Uh, so what do you think about the feasibility of the Moon, especially because they're uh, there have been minerals discovered on the moons, like frozen ice and different types of ions. Uh, my second question is regarding the Outer Space Treaty, that, uh, and basically how do you, how are countries planning to control the debris that is being left in space, especially after recently you found out that India was uh, t tested an anti satellite weapon, so how do you envision that countries should take care of the de debris that they're leaving in space? Uh, thirdly, is about the, uh, for me, is military industrial um, establishment that is taking place because there are so many private people who are interested in space and building a space force. And now France has joined to be the fourth country that is interested in building a space force. So there are many people who want to be contractors to this, uh, to the defense department. So there are so many people coming up, making out to make a lot of money from uh, creating weapons. At the same time, it's becoming hard to create peace because people are making money from creating weapons and anti-satellite weapons. Thank you. Thank you. And finally? Yes, thank you. Sibylle Bala from CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Since this panel is about arms control in the 21st century and is about creative thinking, I would like to put an intellectual challenge to the panelists. Think ahead at least 10 years, at least to 2029. What kind of arms control treaties, institutions, regimes would you like to see in place then? And what kind of changes to existing institutions do you think should happen by then? Feel free to think ahead, further ahead 15, 20 years if you'd like to. Thank you. Okay, so, the Minister, you've been asked. Should I respond to all the questions? Well, you've certainly been, you, you, you've interestingly been asked <laughs> to respond to a quote from okay, John okay. Bolton. So, yeah, well, well, I think that, well. Uh, so you can start there. So you are absolutely right, and I think uh, I found uh, the response in your question. It will be very, very dangerous uh, to sit idle and waiting uh, 2000, uh, February 2021, and then administration could say it's over. It's not about political willingness, it's about timing. That's why we do propose to start, to start as soon as possible uh, consultations with the United States on how to extend the treaty. Uh, and this is very important, and I do not want to repeat my points. On, on uh, other issues, uh, I think when it comes about the uh, new factors affecting security and stability, it's not only the China that should play a role, but from the Russian point of view, if we are serious about the uh, going down in the levels of uh, strategic uh, assets, of course, at a certain point, all other players could become of this uh, picture, including UK, of course, France, China, and maybe others. That's why we are very supportive to all these kind of ideas that, that provide incentives for us to start this debate. If my memory serves me right, and uh, this was the last edition of CIPRI, uh, I think the number of uh, nukes uh, in China are absolutely the same with, with the, the French one. About the At least, well, yeah. On, on Moon, I, I still remember that, uh, well, when I was a student, uh, there was Moon Convention, which is prohibiting military maneuvers on the Moon, and I hope that it will remain. But uh, I think that uh, we have to look at uh, things not only from this uh, 
um, new technologies uh, effect, but also from the point of view of operational spheres. I'm following NATO uh, philosophy now and uh, not logic. In fact, in so-called classic uh, spheres of operation, be it ground, air, and sea, mankind have gained enough experience how to address this or that uh, military security situation, military planning. Uh, we do know what kind of instruments could be employed in the situation when there is a political agreement on doing that. When it comes about cyber and space, our strong belief is that the time is ripe for uh, preventive action. For preventive action, it should not be looked from the point of view of geopolitical competition. And NATO, NATO, when decides, okay, we declare the cyber and uh, space will become operational sphere of NATO, this is not the, the uh, movement in the right direction. We do want to talk about prevention, prevention of the use of the cyberspace for military purposes. And secondly, we do want uh, to agree uh, on uh, prevention uh, of space from uh, placement of uh, any weapons which exist. That's why we did propose a draft treaty in the framework of United Nations. That's why we proposed to do the first step uh, uh, in the form of political commitment not to deploy first any weapons in the state. And we invite all nations uh, to join us in this attempt at least to write off these two operational spheres from uh, this uh, geopolitical competition we face in so-called traditional spheres of operation. Okay, thank you. I, I think... <clears throat> Just to follow up maybe on what Alexander Grushko said on, on NATO and, and space, uh, it's true that there is a new um, NATO um, um, uh, strategy on, uh, on space, uh, but NATO has... Uh, so there is field of operation. Um, and there are some uh, um, um, uh, parameters that have been decided in the alliance, but NATO has no intention to put weapons in space, <laughs> I have to say, and develop its own space capabilities. There will be no NATO operations in space, and all NATO activities uh, will be in accordance with international law, which is, leads me to the last question of Sabine Bauer to, uh, on CIPRI. You said, you know, dream on in what, what could be or what would be the, uh, the ideal result uh, of this uh, the d discussion we try to uh, push, which is rethinking arms control and at the same time, uh, of course, uh, gaining time with the extension of the New START Treaty. I think um, um, I have two answers to that. We started in this rethinking arms control area with the lethal autonomous weapons questions. Why? because we think um, that the most, challenge, uh, the most uh, pertinent challenge in new technologies uh, having uh, in the field of cyber uh, space uh, has to do with artificial intelligence. And the predictability uh, um, argument and stability, but above all the predictability uh, argument you brought, uh, Richard Bird, is of course uh, connected to that. Uh, the, there will be in the future a quicker warfare. There is already a quicker warfare than we had 10 years ago. <coughs> 20 years ago, because technology uh, technology is advanced, so we won't maybe have the, uh, the time to hold our breath two weeks, uh, like in the 60s, and there will be no Stanislav um, uh, uh, Petrov moment, like in the 80s, where a human being had the opportunity to judge there was a false alarm, the system had a false uh, information, and uh, thus prevented with a human factor, with a human eye throwing on this information he had seen on the, on the uh, computer uh, um, installations that that was a false alarm and prevented maybe a third uh, uh, a world war, a nuclear uh, world war. This human factor and the, um, uh, the lack of human factors, the more and more precise uh, uh, weapons which are acting more and more autonomous, I think this would, should be one of the main uh, targets uh, for the uh, arms control architecture in 29, if we can choose it. Thank you. Richard? Yeah, just a couple of quick observations. One, this question about the moon and I think, I think the question involved real estate on the moon. Uh, that's a dangerous question. You better be careful in talking about that in Washington because I'm sure the president would like to put a Trump Tower there. <laughs> no. 
be careful. <laughs> uh, secondly, uh, on China, what, uh, what one of the most interesting uh, experiences I had negotiating and with the with the Russians on this on, on nuclear arms control over the years it's been the whole question of verification and and what we, we were able to do in the early 1990s was actually for the first time which I thought would have been impossible before to get on-site inspection where you could actually go to Russian missile silos they would open the silos they would take screwdrivers, take the nose cone off, and you could count the number of multiple warheads on those missiles. If you had told me that, that in the 80s that, that we could have done that, I would have said that's impossible. That's my answer on China. I think because we, we're not in a position now where, with the Chinese, we can, uh, we can negotiate equal levels. We have to get down to a low enough number to make it uh, of interest to the, uh, make it equitable. But I think we need to begin looking for exercises to bring China into the process. And the Chinese have a, a very, let's call it mysterious kind of deterrent. Uh, their missiles are deployed in caves. And one thing I would begin to think about doing is, is inviting the Chinese to both Russia and the United States with, uh, with inspectors. Let the Chinese watch how Russia and the United States inspect each other's nuclear forces. And then to begin the process of, of having them begin to propose how they could become more open and, and transparent in the process. It's got to be a learning experience. It's not going to happen overnight. And I think we need to, to start, uh, we need to, uh, to start now. And finally, 2029, I'll give you, I have to give you the textbook answer since I'm the USA chairman of Global Zero. In, 19, in 2029, I don't want to see any nuclear weapons at all. And people say that's a crazy vision, but I want to remind you, it was only 10 years ago that uh, four well-known gentlemen, including Henry Kissinger, George Shultz, uh, Bill Perry, and Sam Nunn actually wrote a famous uh, op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal proposing just that. So we, 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 we have to be, I think, ambitious in looking into the future. So, well, I want to first address the question of how to bring in China. Um, I wouldn't spend time explaining how difficult that would be, <laughs> but I would say there is some positive uh, factors as well. For instance, economic factor. Um, the big powers, US, China, Russia, their economic situation do not necessarily look particularly good. Especially in China, after decades of rapid growth, their internal structural economic problems start to emerge. And in addition to the external pressure due to the trade war, I don't think China would have as much resource to invest in uh, comprehensive military development as, as it is right now. Um, if the US threatens to deploy you know, large numbers of uh, INF missiles in the Asia Pacific region, and China would feel uh, forced to respond by enlarging its own arsenal, those scenarios would be extremely expensive. So I think uh, given the, the possible economic constraint, that would provide a positive motivation uh, for some co co uh, cooperative uh, measures to, to control or contain the arms race. If you raise arms control proposals with China, it has to be asymmetrical. Right? There's no way we can simply apply the US-Russia uh, a parity and, and symmetric model, but there are many ways to offer interesting and creative asymmetric proposals to China, right? For example, you can include all medium uh, range missiles and set an overall seating because the US has more sea-based and air-based systems and China has more land-based systems. Or you can go one step further and uh, have an overall seating for, for all types of missiles, land-based, sea-based, and regardless of the range, 
uh, because even though the U.S. has, has uh, many longer range systems, China has more shorter range ones. Uh, and there are many ways to do, do, to do quid pro quos between the two countries for, or among the three, the, the big three. Um, you know, for example, for China to provide more transparency on the role of its theater nuclear weapons in return for U.S. and Russia to refrain from deploying new INF range missiles. There are many ways. I think I agree. Uh, research institutes could uh, play an important role to offer uh, interesting ideas. I think there is a role, especially for EU countries to oh play God. here, because any pressure from the United States for China to join arms control would be viewed very suspiciously, uh, suspiciously as an effort by U.S. Yeah, to Mike. use arms control as a tool to, con to contain China and, and win in a geopolitical competition. But if the EU countries and other uh, uh, countries that, that, that are neutral are uh, uh, you know, stepping up their voices calling for the big powers to do arms control, there will be an interest in China to listen because China now sees the U.S. is retreating from its leadership role in international arms control. And China has an interest to compete for that leadership role to build up its image as a responsible power. Um, I will also want to echo your point on uh, uh, verification uh, and inspection. Uh, you know, China is very suspicious about uh, the, the efficacy of arms control verification. If you ask Chinese experts why they don't like arms control, they don't think about arms control, you would hear this argument very often, which is even if China enters arms control treaty with the big powers, because these big powers have much more advanced te technologies, it's much easier for them to cheat, to secretly develop their capabilities and China would end up being the only one that is bound by the treaty. So there's very uh, real suspicion and distrust about verification. Mm -hmm. But China doesn't appreciate so far that, in fact, during the Cold War, even though the United States has even greater distrust towards the Soviet Union, the U.S. was able to gain some trust and confidence through sour and strict verification measures. So you need to build, a, build up their Chinese capacity the Chinese experts who understand and appreciate those. Tom. I hope you can invite Chinese inspectors to a new START treaty as long as the treaty will still be there uh, in a few years. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. Sorry to cut you off. Sorry, I think we have time for just one final comment. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. And the transparency, urgency, innovation you all bring to this, uh, this topic. I, I wanted to circle back to the ethics. Maybe you should tell us who you are, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Dan Holtrup, State Department, Arms Control Bureau. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to circle back to the... <laughs> Go on. The ethical question that was brought up. Um, uh, the sense of keeping humans in the loop, for instance, for combat. Um, the concern about artificial intelligence. So uh, do all the countries that, you've, that you represent, are you uh, interested in emphasizing ethical development of new technology in AI so that we, can, um, that we can shape development and use of this technology consistent with our values? Okay, so I don't represent my country, but, but my country's official position is that we will never use autonomous weapons. There always will be a human being in the loop. Well, I think that we don't have time, but... Okay, well... Maybe, oh, no, 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 no. But I could say, what, for example, landmine is autonomous system, by the way, right? If we add some artificial intelligence, maybe its impact will be less, more selective. Yeah, well, we don't use them for that. Uh, we, yes, I know. We do we also, we're also that. part of the uh, four okay. protocol, okay. That's right. So, we're consistent. Please. Yeah, we're actively working on a code of conduct, and that there was, yeah, to uh, uh, to uh, to okay. have a um, responsible uh, beha um, behavior of states on everything that has to do with an enhanced technology. This is not only about the yeah. so-called killer robots; it's on on the the whole impact of having new technologies making quicker warfare without human factor to uh, to. Um, to build trust or to yeah. use uh, the predictability and verification elements. 
So your position officially is to ban them. That's your government's policy. Oh, it's a, it's a two-step. No, no, it's a code of conduct which we are uh, on the seventh of. Um, November, so shortly in Geneva, um, already guiding principles to um, apply, employ, um, to have um, international law um, in, uh, applied to um, the development of potentially autonomous okay, weapons. Thank you, I'm sorry. So, do you know what the Chinese government's position is about autonomous weapons, artificial intelligence? I'm not sure about the government's know. position, but I think uh, compared with traditional areas of arms, I think the new uh, uh, technology, especially AI, um, there are many Chinese young people, young experts, who are closely following the Western debate. They are doing very thorough analysis. That gives me hope, I think, uh, in, in these areas. I think China has a better chance to, to really appreciate the international concern on, on these technologies and be, be more likely to align its position with the rest of the international community. Okay, so Mr. Northup, what's your country's position? Ah, you're working on it. I see. Well, we can help you. Just join us. Don't use them. Thank you.